Okay. Um, I think I think we should make a start so that um, we've got time to discuss a couple of things today. So um, uh, thanks everyone for joining the call as always. Uh, it's very useful to be able to have these more dynamic chats than just uh, discussing issues through GitHub. Um, helps just to work through some of the some of the wrinkles in a bit more detail. Um, so I'll just share the slides. Um, there are, in terms of agenda today, I just wanted to give you a, a quick update on where we are with the booking work um, and highlight uh, one of the key changes to the spec for the, the 1.0 draft that was published earlier today. Uh, and then just talk about um, one of the issues uh, that has come up in the feedback on the 2.0 uh, specification, the 2.0 modeling spec. Uh, and then if we have time, uh, we can cover anything else that people want to discuss today. Um, so just in terms of a, a progress update for, for booking, um, we're a little bit behind where we would planned to be. I had hoped to get a 1.0 draft out um, a week or two ago, um, but just through a combination of holidays and sickness, we um, didn't quite hit that deadline. So, um, uh, but the work has now largely been done and I sent an email to the mailing list this morning just to let everyone know that there is a, <clears throat> a 1.0 draft um, now available. Um, I provided a summary of the changes to the list, um, but there, which has got more detail. Um, but for me, there's basically three main uh, things just to kind of uh, let people know. Um, the first is that there's been some reworking to the request response formats um, based on some discussions that we've been having in the team here and some discussions that we had on uh, one of the calls a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is largely to make the, um, the responses slightly less verbose um, and to correct a couple of the properties that we're using um, so that they were aligned with the rest of the um, our specification and also schema.org. So um, that's largely just evident in changes to the, the examples in the document. Um, the other thing that we've done is taken on the feedback around uh, how we communicate terms and conditions, privacy policies, cancellation policies, um, to make sure that the booking workflow is uh, GDPR compliant and um, uh, goes smooth, more smoothly for participants. Um, in looking at the, the cancellation um, workflow, we realized that we had overlooked one, uh, which is the kind of the, the new section that appears in the spec. So um, we had in the 0 0.8 draft, we had a mechanism for how a broker could cancel um, a booking on behalf of a participant. Um, so they could say they no longer want to to attend um, and the, in the 1.0 spec there's some clarifications in there so that um, for example um, it's possible for a platform to indicate um, when cancel up until when cancellations can be accepted so um, you know they're specifying a window uh, within which um, somebody could change their mind otherwise they're kind of committed um, but we, what we hadn't um, uh, documented, uh, which is really just an oversight, is that there are occasions where the booking system needs to cancel uh, an event. The organizer might have decided that they can no longer run it, uh, or a facility might have to be closed for some reason. So what we so we hadn't really thought through how that um, interaction happens. So how does the booking system update the broker to tell, so that everyone is clear that um, that event has uh, been cancelled. The booking system can already update a customer because they have the customer details as part of the booking, so they can you know, send an email or, or give them a call or whatever in order to let them know. But it's important that the booking system be able to update the broker because it's the broker that is responsible for um, taking payment and handling refunds. So we needed to make some updates to the spec to um, start defining how brokers can expose an API to allow a booking system to alert them to the fact that an event has been cancelled or a facility has been closed. Um, so there's a, um, in the draft document that I circulated earlier, so this, uh, I'm just looking at the, 
the 1.0 uh, drafts, which is dated uh, today. Um, there is a new section, uh, it's currently 5.6.2, uh, which is booking system originated cancellation. So this goes into a bit more detail about what, how we envisage this workflow um, happening. Uh, and I just wanted to go through it at a high level now on the call just to see if anyone had any feedback. Um, I'll, I'll say at the start that there's, um, this section of the, uh, the spec needs a bit more detail going into it, but we wanted to put some uh, draft text out for discussion before getting into um, uh, providing examples. So this needs to be revised to um, just give some examples of what the API calls will look like between the booking system and the, and the provider. Can I throw in a comment, Lee? By the way, hello, everybody. Oh, hello. Hi, um, Ian here, Ian from Legend. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about cancelling an order. Um, whilst I recognise at the moment the intent is to only have one booking per order, in version 1. not a lot, so you'll be able to have multiple bookings in an order, mm -hmm. and you typically cancel all the bookings. So someone might uh, book a badminton court at 3 o'clock and a swimming session at 6 o'clock. Uh, only one of them would get cancelled. So granularity of the cancellation needs to reflect that rather than the order level yeah okay that, that, that's, a, that's a good point yep um, I don't think we've uh, I don't think in this we have allowed for that it's currently just the, the order because in, in this version it's just a kind of one-to-one -one. Um, but yeah we need to think about how that might work um, so the the approach we're taking is to um, use what's called a webhook which is a an uh, an approach that has is used in um, lots of platform to platform integrations. So the idea would be that as the booking system um, was updated to note that an event was cancelled, then they would send um, they would do a uh, an API call on an API that is exposed by the broker. Um, and what we've documented is that they would post an update to the broker to say effectively that this order or um, you know, to clarify that this this part of the booking um, has been cancelled um, it would then be up to the broker to take action based on that so they may you know want to update some systems you know, status in their own system but most importantly um, carry out any necessary refunds um, as well as doing that um, we've also said that they should also then uh, update the booking system to indicate that that refund has uh, taken place. Uh, and the reason for that is to make sure that um, both ends of the communication um, are clear, are, that it's transparent that, the, that that has happened, so that whoever is engaging with the customer uh, or whoever the customer chooses to to you know, approach about refunds, everyone has the right information you know, to note that, um, that the money has been refunded. Um, so this does put some extra requirements on both booking systems and brokers. Um, so the booking system will need to be able to, for example, uh, record uh, the, the location of these URLs for the brokers that they've authorized to use their API. Um, and they will need to be able to send the appropriate API calls to those brokers um, for just the, the bookings that are relevant to that broker. So we don't expect a booking system to just have a kind of fire hose of notifications that they would actually just kind of target the updates to the, the relevant broker. Um, the extra requirements on the broker is that obviously they will need to expose um, this API endpoint um, for booking systems to use. Um, so that's some extra infrastructure that you need to, to consider. Um, so that's, that's it in overview. Does anyone have any comments or questions on the kind of basic mechanism? Um, we talked before about the um, booking system, um, the webhook receiver of the broker getting a notification per order. It now is talking about an array of orders. So that would require the booking system to do some type of aggregation before sending it is that right it's um it 
it's specified as an array to give flexibility. If a booking system wanted to just um, send out an update um, for each one as it happens, that's fine. There's no assumption that you would you would batch them up. Um, I think this is just where an example, the examples which we haven't got in here yet, would make that clearer. I think the use case for me is where you've you've got uh, the pools out. Uh, all the gyms out and there's actually five or six different people booked in there so you'd actually want to say this resource is not free anymore these are the things affected and that will probably be an array of orders and likely it'd be easy to implement that by sending them all that at once and it would be by actually sending out individual requests so I, can, I get the point of that obviously you could equally well just send out individual requests yeah yeah i mean where, where i have um implemented these in the past i think that you, there's usually we want some flexibility about whether you you know, immediately on a state transition in your, you know, your database or platform to send an API call or whether you just want to send those out every five minutes, 10 minutes, hourly, you know, depending on what type of notifications there are. So I think this just gives a bit of, bit, bit of flexibility both sides if we... Um, yeah, that makes sense totally. And to Ian's point on the pool closure, that, yeah, that would be one trigger, wouldn't it, on a database that would then trigger several records. So. Would there ever be a, a um, maybe not in this version, a chance to replay um, cancellations as well if needed? So if you, for example, if you have a network outage or something like that, you could go back and get the uh, cancellations for a specific date or time? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion. I hadn't thought about that. Was there a general question here about what if, what's the responsibility of the booking system to ensure the webhook? I mean, it, it, actually, that 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 API request goes through and is received successfully by the broker. So it, if it's received successfully by the broker, then I think it's the broker's responsibility then to to act on it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but if it's um, not, if, it's not received. Yeah, if you if there was an error condition or whatever, then I think it, the onus is on the booking system to retry. Hence the replay. So if you if you. If you know there's been a problem, you could go back and replay it in some way. The, the other way, the other way I think that Nick's talking about is is kind of difficult because it's unfair. I feel on the booking thing to have to keep trying to send all the stuff. It, it should be down to the consuming one to try and go and get the information back again at some point. Yeah, I, but yeah, yeah, that's your point. I'm just wondering what would what would be the expectation on the broker that they should be regularly polling for cancellations in just in case they missed any webhooks um, because if you did it that way then you we could not use a webhook and just require just put that requirement on a broker anyway well i was just thinking sort of like a safety thing would be so you get the the webhook that's fired on a state change for example but then uh, you might have it's almost a bit but i suppose it's a bit like a checksum in the sense that you could then go and poll it at the end of the day look for all the cancellations and you can reconcile them off in case you've missed any. Yeah. What do, what do you want to think about that? Uh, I, I think it's a question of ownership, really. Um, I think if you're saying it's the broker's responsibility to poll, um, it's very difficult to police that. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to write software or a system that a help desk checks every day to make sure it's been pulled every hour. It's just not going to happen. I think that would be even more true for smaller um, providers or uh, operators. Uh, whereas if we say, you know, if we're going to send information to the broker, then we know there has to be a webhook. And if there's not a webhook, we can say we're not doing it. Yeah. And therefore it gives us some control of knowing that they've got some, some process in place um, rather than being passive about it. So I kind of prefer the webhook to be honest. Well, what happens if that that transmission fails, or is something happens, you know, to destroy or to make it an incomplete delivery? I think. Well, I think to start with, we've got to assume. Um, I think that if we don't get a response back, we've got to send it again. Perhaps we need to have some ID within it to say this is the, you know, this is a batch we're sending, and if it gets received twice, the the broken is not to process it the second time. Um, but it, it would mean that there's some onus to do a retry process um, on the part of the provider. Yeah, or, and that, it, 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 there's a name for that, idempotent 
there's a name for that type of idea, isn't there? That that sounds like a really good idea, especially if if the things can get retried more than once and processing could fail for a number of reasons. Um, but I don't know how how many times would we be expecting the retry to? So let's say that a, let's say a broker goes down for for a, a five minute period, for example. Um, would we be expecting the booking system to retry that webhook over for an hour or? I don't know. I think you provide guidance for that. I mean, um, it, 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 there's no right answer to this. Uh, it depends. Uh, I, what we do in situations like this is to kind of have a, a back off type situation. So try again in a second, try again in a minute, try again in 10 minutes, try again in 20 minutes, try again in an hour and a half, give up. And when you give up, you have some kind of alert that, that shows what's going on because it may mean the broker's going out of business. Yeah, that's really good. That's really yeah, good. Or, you know, and I think the, the also, I think there's, I think the, the final um, scenario is that you might have to do some manual processing. You know, there's, there's, with any software system, there's always some shit you've got to deal with manually. So I think if you can't get hold of a, a system for a day, um, then you can solve that with a manual process and up to the broker to implement something that can manually say, oh, I haven't had this pill's been cancelled. Maybe. Not sure about that one. Yeah, oh, I, I agree. But, there is, ultimately, there's a, there's a fallback. I, I'm, just, I'm just mulling over the... So I think doing the, the retry it sounds good. Um, it's just whether there is also a kind of safety net of here's an endpoint you can request to get the. Um, so you know. I, 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 what might help with this is that the opportunity API, or at least at least I think part of the booking spec, in fact, defines an orders endpoint which is already queryable. So you can already request, you can already do a get request on orders to get a list of orders. You can in, then Im implicitly filter those orders by parameters. And so it wouldn't be a huge amount of extra work to say you can filter those orders by uh, status and then only get the cancellations. Um, I guess there's a, ch there's a challenge here about what Ian said earlier. If there's items within an order are cancelled, um, and then how do we, because you could have the same order cancelled twice for two different items and then maybe it just appears once with timestamp saying these are the latest this is the latest status it's cancelled um and uh, so you can get that get the, that feed yeah that, that might work although if we're if we're attaching a kind of a unique id to something so that the request can be item potent it would be like the notification so i think you'd have to have a an endpoint which was give me the list of notifications you've tried to send me um, with a, yeah, so you can, um, if I've missed them, my webhook endpoint was down, then I can attempt to replay them. My, my only challenge with that would be that for a smaller booking systems, um, that would require an, another database table and storage of the notifications. And if there are just, it's more things to keep in sync as opposed to just querying on the existing table for a status. Not necessarily, it depends whether you are, they're attaching state to that or not. Um, if, it, if it was just give me a list of the things that you've sent me, then you should be able to regenerate that from the, I, I would have assumed you could regenerate that from the your existing tables because you've had status updates. I assume you've got modification dates on, on your event table and that kind of thing. Oh, so it's like an RPDE feed for um, um, orders type thing. But, but 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 per per provider, so you're authenticated into it, so you only get your yeah updates. Gosh, sorry, who's 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 building the booking system? There'll there'll be lots of distributed potentially booking systems as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're putting an awful lot of effort on the person doing the booking system to or the, the, the organization um, to have to keep sending out all these um, things all the time so I, I was sorry I was kind of looking at it more more of the consumer should take on the, the effort if they want to be taking you know if they're broke they're doing a the brokerage they should be taking on the effort of checking whether um, a booking has been cancelled and, uh, and reconciling it in their own systems ultimately the booking system is the canonical source of whether something has been booked or has been cancelled 
and then the other systems would pull that and pull that information back to update their systems because they also might want to tweak how they inform the customer that the, the booking's been cancelled, wouldn't they? This is exactly the same problem that the RPDE, um, well, that, that whole conversation we went through, the um, synchronization between two systems. So you've got, you've got the booking system and then you've got the broker and you want to make sure that you've got a synchronized, well, the RPDE design was for a synchronization of the activities so that you can get everything to be synchronized. The reason that was a good idea in that case was because of open data, because it couldn't be a webhook, it had to be polling so that it could be open. Um, which then leads you to that type of design. I suppose this isn't open data because it's orders, it's you know, details of bits of credit cards and all that kind of stuff. So it's all authenticated. Um, and it's on a per broker basis. So it's a slightly different use case. And I guess that's why we have the option. I feel like we're having basically a little bit of the same conversation, which is good. So there's both options available of webhooks versus polling. And... Um, well, I am new, yeah, to this. So, uh, to the to the, your discussions, I've missed up some of that. But uh, in terms of authentication, is that like OAuth two or something like that? So, is that is the same that same concerns about the the data that's being exchanged if it's if it's protected by the tokens? Um, so, we, so we're not specifying a uh, authentication mechanism in the. Okay, API. Sorry, right, okay, it'll be up to them. But um, the way that well, there's a discussion to be had about how much detail you, if we're using, whether it's um, webhooks or a, a, a notification feed of some form, there's a question to be had about how much detail you put in that. Um, one approach is that you just provide the minimum amount, you know, a status update and the relevant IDs for the things that have been changed. And then you, um, the broker would then use the existing API calls that we've documented in order to get further information. So that means we wouldn't have another endpoint that could be feeding out uh, customer information. I, I kind of, personally, I kind of prefer that because it keeps the kind of API surface a bit smaller. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. I feel like that's probably the, that's probably the, you're you're totally right. There's probably no way we want to be per passing personal data out to a webhook. That seems a bit nuts from all kinds of yeah. uh, ISO twenty seven thousand one etc. Yeah. All that jazz. Um, but, but so it sounds like the trade-off then if if that's not a thing is either sending these uh notifications to then create more traffic on the api to to get each response as a result or a feed approach where all that data is just in the feed and you just rpde style just get the stuff and then um you just you just consume it so i feel like of those two approaches it might actually be easier I suppose what's what's basically easier for the booking system to implement, it might be that RPDE is easier because then you can just get the latest. Um, it's just a simple query to implement rather than implementing a whole webhook mechanism. I think the, um, from a, I'm not sure I, I can say this, but from a kind of vaguely technical perspective, certainly for legend, um, we've got the, the cash for the feed, um, but it's not specific to who's booked through what. So we know that there's five places left we know there's seven being booked, but we don't really know which individuals have booked them. Uh, I mean that just in terms of an idea or something. And we certainly don't know at that point what the mechanism was for being booked, what the particular broker was. So you know, that's quite a lot of additional information to put into the, um, the cache because you actually have to cache all the bookings individually as well as the quantities that are remaining. Um, and that feels to me like quite a lot of overhead compared to some um i guess queuing system for this these events have been cancelled go and tell the relevant brokers because that we kind of referring back to other information rather than cast information yeah i i think just to clarify i don't think we're not i don't think we're suggesting uh changing the way that rpd feeds are generated so that they're per consumer and including the status in there i think nick was just saying as a general mechanism that's similar to providing a, a list of notifications from an api I agree. And I'm just saying there's additional technical complexities because you can't go necessarily off the same source data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like there's a preference there for, in terms of legend to have the webhooks so that when you, um, it's basically you've got APIs there that are ready to respond to a, a, a latest order status. 
I, I prefer that, and one of the reasons we prefer this is because cancellation would be quite short notice. Yes. So if if you uh, from from uh, a an operator's perspective, if there's a cancellation, we want people to be informed within minutes, ideally, um, rather than informed sometime that day. So you might have something that's an hour away, but it's been cancelled. And if you have a web hook, you can inform the booking system, the, the broker, immediately. Yeah. Whereas if the, the 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 broker is actually calling you on this fee, you don't really have any control over over the latency. Yeah. 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 I mean, the the, the web hook has that has that advantage. It is a bit more real real time, which means that some people might get their refunds quicker as well. I think also a lot of the operators and providers don't necessarily have the mechanism to support that notification. So you know, a lot of a lot of our clubs just do it manually. They phone people up, which is obviously not possible through a broker. But I think there may be challenges in getting that implemented um, in the short term. But I think it's good to have it in the spec. Yeah, it's a good challenge. It's something we found with Fusion actually, because they, they their um, uh, refunds process is quite uh, involved. Um, there's a capture manual, can capture bank details and process them out of band so the credit card doesn't get refunded it gets pushed back back into the person's bank account as a whole and it goes through head office and all that kind of stuff um however interestingly when when given the option of using tokenization on a credit card um which they can do via stripe for booking they actually were keen to do that because it saves them um head office headache to to do it that way so um i mean at least they they would use this feature if it was available um in addition to their existing process that they have for uh, uh, other types of cancellation. Mm, okay. What other that brings up something else, which uh, I don't know if it's a concern or not, um, but I'm not sure that the refund process amount or uh, anything of that sort will be quite the same for a cancellation initiated by a, a customer for a member. So within Legend, for example, we might. Um, Obviously, there's cancellation time, the endpoint. If you cancel after that, you don't get anything. But we can apply penalties, uh, and it may be that the cancellation charge is less than the actual charge for the um, the booking. But whereas if it's cancellation from one of our operators, then you'd expect that to be refunded in, in total. So I think some complexity around that that I'm not sure we've captured yet. Yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I was going to cover the last point just to say that you know you'd you'd expect, for example. Um, uh, booking system originated cancellations to you know to be able to happen outside of any cancellation window that a customer might have um, but yeah I hadn't thought about the whether somebody might uh, uh, yeah and it makes sense that they would get the full refund then but I hadn't thought about the other the other side of things um, which suggests that we might need something else uh, in the in the spec the 1.0 I know um, NetPulse were due to join this call, but I feel like they might be another one to ask this question to about webhooks versus polling. Um, I think I think Lynn's on the next one. Yeah, um, I mean, what? Okay, so we, perhaps we can circulate uh, this to a few more people specifically for feedback on this section. I, I'm, you know, based on the discussion so far, I kind of feel like we need a bit of both. Um, so then we, it's kind of a belt and braces that the webhook is the preferred option but a kind of a, a fallback of some description to be able to support, um, you know, uh, replaying notifications would also be useful. Uh, it's up to a booking system if they can, are able to support both. Um, we just need to be clear to everyone what happens if you don't do both. You know, um, if you haven't got a replay, then that means you're gonna be, uh, potentially go quicker into manual reconciliation because you've got less options for the broker to be able to pick things up. Um, I think that puts a lot of onus on the broker to implement both solutions because some of us might implement uh, the webhook, some of us might prefer to implement the polling. Yeah. Um, it's one thing I think where you, you probably need to uh, suggest how frequent the polling should be, what, you know, what the interval should be, um, though it may vary a lot depending on the, on the, the, the provider. Um, but I think you're, what you're saying there effectively is a, bro a, a broker that wants to have a wide remit would have to implement both options. 
Whereas if you stay just where PUC or just the, the polling, then they'd only have to implement one. Um, obviously, from the provider perspective, the, the, uh, the booking system, we would choose which one we wanted. We probably, no one would probably ever build both in. Yeah, yeah I think it's just that there are, there are different failure modes, aren't there? In that, so we, I think we, we agree that the webhook would be, so the advantage of the webhook is it's more real time, because more on, you know, it can be played out quicker. Um, customers can get updated quicker. The downsides are, uh, at the point that was made earlier, that's potentially a lot of traffic going outbound from the booking system, depending on how many brokers they're using uh, or using them. Um, uh, but there's also opportunity to failure because there could be communications failure between the two endpoints. Whereas if you're up with polling, you know, the downside is it's not as real time. Um, if there is breaks in communication, it's between the broker and the booking system and but it means there's no lost data. There's no lost updates because a broker could just retry until they get a successful response. There is a, another option, which is to say that the provider, the booking system, who has the email for the customer, emails the customer directly. Now, the, the refund wouldn't come into play there, but that could be either a fallback or the main approach. Y yeah, so I was... Um... Yeah, so the, again, yeah, there is two parts. There's, there's how does the customer get notified and how does the, how does the refund happen? I was kind of under the impression that a, the booking system might want to just email the user anyway or get in touch with them anyway because it, somebody wants to be, as you said, it's like late notice. So that, that communication needs to happen as soon as possible. It's more the refund bit that I think is the, the kind of critical bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I wonder whether this, I mean, it seems like quite a big decision for this going into 1.0. I wonder whether the circulation to the list of those, because I, I, th I kind of, I'm with in on the, it, getting everyone to implement both is quite a big um, overhead. And also I can see there's, a, the, the, because the main downside of the webhook, from what I can understand is this real time, from what you just kind of laid out there issue, but you can have, relatively real time i mean close to real time polling um in terms of minutes obviously not it won't be seconds but for this for this use case i mean you know monzo with the online banks and i kind of obviously work in seconds when you get the notification instantly that that thing's been cancelled um i don't know if because we're talking about processing a refund here people don't usually expect a refund to occur immediately sometimes it even takes 14 days um so maybe because you know that um, is the thing like so so let's assume that the booking system emails directly uh, immediately so that 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 happens as a notification and then this is implemented as a, a kind of polling mechanism which could happen after it could take a day it could be it could be nightly if they want to process ref if a broker wants to process refunds nightly and they're going to just rely on that email to notify users or they might want to do it every minute if the broker wants to provide a more real-time experience and maybe send app notifications or something to say sessions been cancelled um but they can just they can decide on how they do that because it depends on their use cases and then we don't have to worry about webhooks and that saves a whole load of extra implementation for everyone yeah okay so i think the, the next steps is to spell out um pros and cons of the different approaches um and make sure that we get wider input on it I don't think we can publish 1.0 without having something to, to deal with this use case. So I think we have to, we'll have to have something in place because otherwise there's just a big gap in um, what could be, you know, what is I assume pretty common scenario. So, um, so I think that's the action I'll take from, from this call. We can make sure that on the next call we get um, people who might be specifically interested in this. You mentioned um, NetPulse already, but... Just yeah, wondering, so, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I just wondering about the billing side of this, um, because uh, I guess you've covered that. Because with the webhook side, anyway, um, in that you send the webhook out and it comes back and yes, we've cancelled it, or rather, it tells you they've cancelled it, and then you can put what amounts to a refund notification through. Um, but that would be a refund notification because against the billing, there wouldn't be any cash side of that. So that, that may be a model that people don't really have. We've got external payments, but I don't believe we have external refunds. 
so there's this kind of an implication there that you know, we've, we've never had to process a refund that's handled by a payment that wasn't made to us. Yeah, I don't think. think. Um, so yeah. that's just something to add to the, the little mix there. And um, how would that work out from a billing record, uh, recording that bill aspect? Yeah, it's a notification. Is that you, yeah, you're totally right. Even if we, if we did the feed only option, you would still need something that allowed the broker to say, okay, that refund's been processed to amend the invoice so that it was, it was, it was accurate and for the, that type of refund to be understood. Um, I, I, perhaps I misunderstood what Ian was saying. I thought he was saying that the refunds are typically handled by at the booking system side. Yeah, um, you know, we've got a mechanism to create a refund. When you create, from the accounting perspective, a refund is um, you've got to take money from the, the booking GL and then pay it out as cash. Yeah, so we're going to have to have some other side that says we aren't really paying out of cash, it's against the I suppose the credit or something for the, the, the broker. Um, and I don't think both we have ways. mechanisms like that at the moment. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, that, that'll happen both ways, because when you accept the money from the third party, if you're going to put that in a general ledger somewhere, or you, you, you put that in any ledger, you'd have to, yeah, you, that wouldn't be, I don't know how you'd recognize that. Um, uh, well, we, we do that already for payments, because we, you know, through the APIs we've got at the moment, but this is a new thing for us, and therefore we'd have to add it. It's not impossible. Uh, it's just something we need to think about, and other providers might as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, e even if you said the booking system is going to notify the user, the booking system is going to ha actually handle the refunds, so the broker doesn't have to do anything. There still needs to be a notification mechanism, because depending on the business model yeah. between the broker and the... the, the we, we, we can't do that. The, the, the booking system cannot provide the refund. We don't have anything to refund against. It's going to be, you know, we can't send cash in the post. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just talking <laughs> in, in, in general, you know, the, for transparency on, you know, who actually attending events and what money was paid and received, you'd still need this kind of mechanism. Yeah, agreed. I'm, I'm not, this is not really about the API, it's just me thinking about think changes we might have to make internally. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, you forgive me. I, I have to jump off. Actually, I've got another meeting in two minutes. Um, is there anything else we need to just touch on today? Well, the the other thing I was going to bring up today um, was about uh, actually it's kind of similar area. It's about advanced booking. It's about when um, when advanced bookings are supported, when prepayments are required or optional. Um, but I can. There's an issue that I can send you that's got a discussion. It might be if you've got two minutes here. It might be just quickly uh, worth saying if you um, do you support um, bookings without prepayment for people to make a booking and then turn up on site and book it when they get there. Um, uh, we we do in the system. I would be astonished if our customers support that out of the system. Yeah. yeah. So you know, someone if if someone books um, and does and we'd only allow that generally speaking, uh, when it was booked at front of house. So there's a member you know, comes in, you recognize the faces, I'd like to put badminton next week, I've forgotten my wallet, the old, the old classic, yeah? But you know them, you have a relationship with them, and you've got a reasonable trust that they will turn up, and you've got the bill against them, you've got their address, you can send the boys around with a baseball bat. Not that I think our customers do that, but you never know, yeah? Whereas in this case, you'd be saying, here's someone I don't know, I have their email address, and they want to book something which might be quite expensive, but not pay for it. And if they don't turn up, what recourse do I have? So we do do that. Um, I would not see that as something that would be attractive to our, um, the operators, mm -hmm. our operators. I can see if you've got a kind of fun run um, or, a, 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 or a, a, a Pilates class that you might want to say, you know, bring cash when you turn up because that means they don't have to use a credit card they've got more trust with you and the runner of the class might say that you know one in 10 one in 20 doesn't turn up and then you don't get it but you you win from that by getting a, a, a bigger uh, footfall I, I don't think that's where our operators sit in honesty that's really really helpful uh, okay thank you well my pleasure and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon all right cheers Bye-bye.
Okay, so we've got a uh, maximum of 15 minutes before I have to jump off as well. Um, so just to kind of uh, re-intro that bit, um, the, we've been doing some review on the 2.0 uh, model in spec. Um, so Nick has been doing a, a great job of going through, looking at some of the published feeds and working with people who are prepping to prepare, data, prepare new data releases to um, see how the changes will impact them. Um, there's a number of issues that he's filed where we need some clarifications on the, the spec. Um, just to kind of summarize those, there's a few areas where we have proposed tightening up some of the conformance requirements where we might be doing that a bit too soon. Um, so we're probably going to relax a couple of them. Um, there's a couple of areas where um, we've defined properties uh, for events, um, but they should also be uh, usable for facilities. So there's just um, adding a bit more consistency across how those that information can be used across different uh, types of uh, opportunity. So that just some fairly minor revisions. Um, one of the main things that uh, was I think oversight um, is where in our discussion last time we talked about uh, adding new types of events to clarify between for example, uh, big headline events that are broken up into a, a program of other activities over the course of a day or a couple of days, um, and uh, gym sessions. Um, so we've got that document in the spec, but there's some um, edge cases around how properties are inherited between different events that we haven't fully documented. Uh, I'm not going to try and go through all of those on the call, um, but there will just be some clarifications around that um, that will go into the into a revised draft. Um, which were flagged up as part of the work that we've been doing on the validator. So the validator is being useful as a way to kind of work through some of these issues as well. Um, but uh, one of the issues that uh, has been in discussion for, for a little while, um, I just wanted to run by people now, which is around um, um, some requirements around uh, free events and events that kind of um, can, can or, can or should be booked in advance. Um, so just to summarize those, um, some events or facilities, uh, so this all applies to facilities as well, some are free, so you don't have to pay to take, take part. Um, some events must be booked in advance, so you have to book a, uh, book a slot to use the facility or you have to uh, book a place at an event. Um, it might still be free, but you still have to reserve your space. Um, and then some events, this is a requirement we, that Ian was just talking about, um, some events, it may be that you book, but you don't pay in advance. You might just still pay on the day. Um, now, the, the, the first one um, is already covered in the specification. The second one um, is not covered in the spec. We don't have a way to say that you must book in advance. We've just we've described ways to do that booking, but we haven't, haven't I've got a way to state that clearly. The third one is not is not covered, and we haven't actually discussed before. And this has mainly come up because it seems to be a feature that Google Reserve supports. Um, so it sounds like, from what Ian was saying, that it's not necessarily a requirement from their customers. But I'm assuming that Google Reserve added it because some people are using that that kind of feature. Um, I think that's a reasonable summary, Nick. Yeah, that's that. That's it. Okay. So um, there's a there's an issue on GitHub. It's issue uh, 98 in the, the data model specification. Um, when Nick and I have been having some conversations about this, um, the I just wanted to quickly run by you what I'm proposing, um, just to see what people think of the requirements and the approach. Um, so Nick and I have been uh, discussing adding um, a couple of extra properties to capture whether an event or facility use must be booked in advance um, and whether it uh, has to be paid for in advance as well. So to cover these last two requirements. So um, what I'm suggesting, um, I'm running this past Nick for the first time, is that we put those as properties of offers rather than of the event or the facility use themselves. So we have these two new properties, uh, which can have values 
we'll have a, a predefined values of required, optional, and non. So advanced booking required means you have to book in advance or you can't participate. Optional means you can book a space, but you can also pay on the day. Non means that you can only pay when you turn up, so it's first come, first served. Uh, and then similar for prepayment. So prepayment required, so that you, know, you have to pay in advance. Uh, or optional would mean you can pay in advance or you can choose to turn up and pay on the day. Um, or prepayment non means you can only pay on the day. Um, so there'd be, there'd be some wording to around those, those two things in order to describe how they uh, interact. But I think the key thing is, for me, it seems like these are, these are aspects of, of an offer rather than of the event. Um, because there's other things that we describe, similar things that we describe about events, such as can you cancel them? How long, are, you know, what's your window for cancellation? Um, that kind of thing. Any thoughts on that from anyone? If it's, if it's helpful, uh, I'll open an example. Just quickly reading the, the, the notes, sorry, as well. Uh, I love your, uh, there are two reasons and then four bullet points. That's great. Oh uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of reasons. Uh, uh, yeah, quick, quick look at the, uh, the, the notes. I totally, so Google Reserve for Clarity do have a um, object model that maps ours um, quite si similar in, uh, in some ways. They have a, a weird um, organizer and location combination they call the merchant the merchant is so if you have gll as an organizer and you have a particular leisure center and slough um you know uh, whatever it is new new leisure center um then your um uh gll's new leisure center would be the name of the merchant so by combining those two um as unique things you can create merchants for google um and that that basically works pretty well um, merchants then have um, services. Services are kind of similar to our events. Uh, service describes what, what is available, what kind of descriptions, images, all the stuff around it. Um, and then um, they have something that's quite similar to our sub events, um, which are the tickets for the service. Um, um, sorry, the uh, sorry, the availability of the service, sorry. And the availability, which is like some events, and then there's tickets, which are like offers within those. Um, so they've actually handily mapped. I mean, I don't think they've done it intentionally. It's nothing like schema, um, but it, it does map the, the, the levels that we have. Um, all that to say that they actually don't put this information on the offer level, on the ticket level. They actually do put it on the level below um, that. So on the, well, actually on the level, not even availability, they put it on the service level. So that's the equivalent of our event. Um, not to say that, that I think the logic that you've got here where you've said, you know, you might have membership and you might have situations where they're different mm -hmm. um, does make sense. Uh, I, can't, I kind of see that, I imagine where they're coming from is generally a bit like what Ian was saying. It's probably more of a policy thing than it is a, um, uh, a part, kind of, you're going to have lots of different ways of doing this thing um, because it would be more difficult to control otherwise. So I, maybe that's why it hasn't been put on a more specific level in the Google Reserve model. Um, I suppose the question here is, well, for, for, for if, if, if Google was going to consume this information using their existing model, they'd obviously have to make an assumption about, I, I suppose they'd have to take the... Um, What's the word strictest? Uh, some, you'd probably have to, they probably have to collect all the offers together and then assume the service has whatever the strictest of those is. So if it's always required, the service will say it's always required as a mapping. Yeah, like, well, I, I think what Google wants is a kind of a separate, I think mapping to Google Reserve is a separate set of a separate discussion. It's just kind of what's the, what, does, what does people need in order to, um, uh, to handle this, you know, do, do we have a strong requirement other than from Google Reserve to allow optional uh, prepayments? Um, it seems like advanced booking is a, is a thing, but we haven't allowed um, that we should should consider, but we haven't thought about prepayment. That has also, we're going to be running out of time, but as you notice on the next slide, we haven't really thought about optional prepayments from the booking API either. Um, just go back to your, sorry, just go back to the other one you had. Uh, the, on the spec, based on how you described it, no, uh, but yeah, that's it. 
based on how you've described it in that paragraph or that sentence above, I read that as, so you can do advanced bookings, they are optional, but mm -hmm. the prepayment is required, whereas it, above you're saying that somebody can actually, um, they can pay a five, five quid or they can book in advance. If they do, they pay five quid, otherwise they choose to pay five on a day. So surely prepayment would be optional as well? No, because the, the, pre, the, uh, the, the prepayment would be defined in terms of prepayment for advance booking. Right, okay. So it's like if you, if, you, if you choose optionally to book in advance, you have to pay. Right, okay. Got you. Okay. I see now, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. I think, yeah, I think, I think the um, reality of, I think, I think there's a, there's a challenge here and that with the booking implementations, when we, when we start rolling this out, it's probably when we're really going to hit this um, because there's two, there's two parts to booking, um, which is the reason that um, I guess I introduced the um, prepayment into this proposal rather than just like you say, mapping to Google reserve, that's a separate issue, but um, although interesting about their model and why they've made the decisions they've made in terms of why the requirement is a requirement, um, I think it's an interesting one to include at this point because um, it lowers the barrier to entry for adoption of the booking spec. Um, it doesn't require you to actually implement payment, which is potentially a whole other world of pain for people to get their head around. Um, you could turn, you could tick a box and just allow people to take online um, bookings that don't require prepayment um, pretty easily without needing to get additional kind of. Uh, some integration with Stripe and an account set up with them and all the rest of it and reconciliation. Um, so things like for, for EMD, for example, where they don't have um, a model to take payments, but there are a lot of Zumba classes. Um, this could well be an easy way to get people to start adopting this. Okay. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a, a, a good point. Um, so just going, sorry, we'll have to, I have, Got a hard spot stop in sort of three minutes, but I think that so the quest, question I'm going to leave you all with, I think, and if you can comment on this, it should be useful. Is where, as Nick was saying, if this, if these things are, uh, these options around whether advance booking is required and whether pre prepayment is is required, or you know you can pay on the day. If that's a policy thing, is that going to be a policy of the organizer rather than of you know applies to all of their events? If so, then it's something that could be. Like presented elsewhere rather than cascading down to the offers. We had a similar discussion around cancellation policies as well in that um, we thought that there would be cases where some offers might need might have specific policies but there might be some fallback behavior for um, organizers or specific platforms. So um, yeah in, in the one minute there's another there's another issue um, I can't remember the number off the top of my head where I'm, I've proposed a offer template of some description for use in the organizer um, on for that exact basis so uh, I think the idea with that was that um, like you say there are a lot of things that we're likely to want to put into the offer such as cancellation such as terms and conditions such as um, all this kind of stuff which is it, for the 99% case probably just standard because it's unlikely that, you know, our parks, for example, they will just have a policy for all of their events. Uh, it's unlikely they'll do it individually. Um, so uh, the idea that we could put it in organizer also means that you could put that out of band of the feed if you wanted to. Um, but, uh, but the advantage of doing it with a kind of offer type template type thing is that we can put it in the offer model, but then put the information somewhere else basically best of both worlds we don't have to compromise the model and we can allow it to be more specific where needed but also we don't have to bloat the data because things need to be required in lots of different places okay yeah that's an interesting idea okay all right um i think in terms of moving this discussion forward i think again um i'd love to circulate it to the list um and uh, elsewhere just to get uh, some other input from people um, I mean, I think it's a relatively straightforward requirement. It's just kind of where we introduce it. Yeah, my, my take would be if you if you put it on putting it on offer makes makes a lot of sense. Um, if there's a, a mechanism of specifying it more generally, so it can be inherited, um, which you can already do with offers. Actually, you can already inherit you can already inherit offers from events, can't you? So um, um, only the whole offer that this kind of partial thing is, we haven't defined. No. Ah, fine. Okay. 
Okay, so I, apologies, I, I need to wrap this up quite, quite quickly. Um, it, it has been, again, it's been a really useful discussion. Um, I will take an action to send an update after, um, this afternoon to the list and ask people to comment on specific issues uh, and discuss the proposals in a bit more detail so we can move this forward. The, the plan is um, to try and get the, the modeling spec done um, and released as a kind of candidate spec um, you know, in the next, if not today, then tomorrow. Uh, and we might need to just give people a little bit more time if we've got uh, these issues still open. The booking spec, the, the idea was to give that a few more weeks to get the tires on it, which sounds like we need to do um, for the other uh, for the other discussion. Um, so um, thanks everyone for coming along um, and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers guys, bye bye.